let's get started. Okay, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our Vector of Faculty Affiliate Professor Jeffrey Rosenthal from Department of Statistical Sciences at the University of Toronto. Professor Rosenthal is a probabilist who is very well known for his contributions of Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. He has uh, published well over 100 research papers and five books, including the bestseller book, Struck by Lightning, The Curious World of Probabilities, which is on its 16th edition and translated to 10 languages. Professor Rosenthal's research has been recognized by many awards, and I'm gonna list a few here. So he has been awarded COPS president, Presidency Award, which is the most prestigious honor given by the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies. CRM SSC Prize, SSC Gold Medal, President's Impact Award, and he's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, he's our speaker today, and he will talk about his work on adaptive metropolis algorithms. All yours, Jeff. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Murat, for that uh, very nice introduction, and thanks to Aaron for organizing things, and uh, Thanks to all of you for coming. I'll, I'll make just one more time the request that if any of the rest of you are willing to turn on your camera, I'm so much prefer to have an interactive session. So if you're willing to turn on your camera, you'll make me very happy. There comes a couple more, Nelson and Kiros, a few people. So thank you very much for joining and thanks to all of you for being here. It's uh, an honor for me to be speaking at, although I have to put add in quotes, but at the Vector Institute. Um, I've been working on uh, Monte Carlo algorithms, MCMC things for many, many years which I consider to be sort of a, a close cousin of, uh, of uh, machine learning and the kind of things that the Vector Institute specialize in, but it's not exactly the same. And of course, as machine learning got more and more uh, important, as I don't have to tell you for so many different applications, I thought, you know, I really should move a little more in that direction. And then when, when uh, AlphaGo beat the world Go champion, I just knew that was the direction I had to move in. So uh, I, ever since I've been sort of nudging a little more in the direction of more pure uh, machine learning. And so, getting a, um, a, a, a faculty affiliation with the Vector Institute was a great honor for me. And it was just almost exactly a year ago, I checked that I was handed my key card to get access to the Vector Institute building. And it was a moment of great pride. I took a picture of myself with my card. And I didn't realize that in order to prevent me from going to the building, you would create a global pandemic and shut everything down. So I couldn't go into the Vector Institute building anymore uh, after getting my key card and everything. But nonetheless, it's still a great pride for me. So I'm Glad to be here today and try to increase connections between the sort of Monte Carlo world and the machine learning world, because I do think they have a lot in common. There's quite a close cousins and uh, not exactly the same, but uh, they have a lot of overlap. So um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, adapting the Metropolis algorithm, but um, I wanted to keep it fairly elementary because I think some of us come from different backgrounds and um, I'm not even sure everyone sort of knows what the Metropolis algorithm is. So I'm going to take it slow and sort of illustrate it with some, uh, some graphical illustrations and then illustrate some of the research ideas that I work on. So um, to get started, I'll have what I'll say sort of a motivation that usually the context, especially from the more statistical world to do with Monte Carlo algorithms or MCMC algorithms is that we have some probability density function, could be like a probability function, could be a, a, a discrete function. So in other words, a bunch of probabilities which add up to one or a continuous function, meaning it's a density which integrates to one. And most common in my world, that comes from a Bayesian inference problem and it's the posterior distribution, but actually this is extremely general and you could have any kind of probability distribution, any kind of probabilities where you say, I just like to know about these different probabilities. And it could be a very complicated function and it could be high dimensional. I was just working on a problem where the dimension was 22, but it could be higher dimension too. So it could be continuous or discrete high dimensional, pretty complicated. And for today's talk to illustrate the points, I'm gonna keep it very simple. And I wrote a little JavaScript uh, simulation on a state space of just six discrete points. So I'll flip back and forth quite a bit. So let me flip now and just to make sure you can all see this pink rectangle now, right? Yeah, I see some nodding. So, um, so this is a very simple illustration of a lot of the ideas I wanna talk about. And here's a state space consisting of six points. So I don't know if you can read the numbers, but it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And these blue bars represent pi of x, or the probabilities of those states. So pi of 1 is about 0.11, it looks like. In this case, pi of 2 is about 0.21. Pi of 3 is about 0.09 or something, and so on. And these are heights which add up to 1. So this is a probability distribution. And again, I want you to think this is a stand-in for a big, complicated, high-dimensional, important probability distribution, which 
say it was an application from health, it might involve many different patients and their medical history and their blood pressure and their results of treatment and all sorts of different things all tied up in some really big complicated probability distribution. But for us, it's just six points. And what we're gonna say is we're gonna wanna sample from this distribution. So I'm gonna come back to this quite a bit, but for now, let me go back to the slides and say, typically when we have this big complicated function pi, we would like to compute things about it. And the most common things are expected values. So if it was a discrete case, we might have some function h and we say, well, we wanna know about the sum of h of x times pi of x. So h of x, if it was a medical experiment could be you know, the um, maybe just the indicator function of whether the patient survived the treatment. So we wanna know what's the probability you'll survive or it could be the probability, what's the uh, amount by which the blood pressure will decrease when you take this drug or something like that. So on a discrete state space, we can think of it as a sum. On a continuous state space, we can think of it as an integral, but either way, it's some expected value where we're saying, according to the probabilities from this big complicated function pi, what is the average or expected value of some functional? And at this level of generality, this is something that comes up really in just about every important modern application of any kind of thing with uh, statistics, with data, with inference, any sort of real world thing. You wanna say what happens on average given all this information that we have. And so of course, if you know your calculus, you say, well, we know how to do sums, we know how to do integrals, but typically in the applications, this would be too difficult for us to be able to solve using something like calculus. Um, you all know about numerical integration or, or for that matter, numerical summation. And if it's not too high dimensional and it's not too bad, you might be able to do it by numerical integration. And if you can, it's actually better because that's gonna be more reliable than Monte Carlo sometimes. But for a typical application that might be too slow as well. Um, so what do we do? So that's kind of the motivation for all of the Monte Carlo work that I work on. So I hope that's clear enough. Um, and then what's the idea of Monte Carlo estimation? Well, the idea is that if we could write a computer program to sample from pi, right? So I think you have probably people are familiar with this where you know maybe pi represents the probabilities for a 22 dimensional vector, like the example I mentioned. And then we'd say, let's write a computer program which generates random 22 dimensional vectors, which each have the distribution given by pi. So all their probabilities are the probabilities given by this complicated function pi. And if we could do that, then we can say, no problem. We wanted an expected value, which was a true sum over the whole space or a true integral, but no problem. We'll estimate it by just taking the average of these H functions over these vectors that we simulate. So that's Monte Carlo in a nutshell. You've probably seen it before, but if you haven't, that's the idea of Monte Carlo. We say, you know what? We're gonna uh, simulate a bunch of variables and then we're gonna take the average value. So this could be a random simulation of let's say the effect of a blood pressure medication. And this could be on average, according to our simulation, what's the average value by which the blood, blood pressure will decrease when you take this pill or something like that. So that is pretty straightforward if you can write a computer program to simulate this sequence of random variables, right? And um, I know you're all really good with computers, so you can probably write lots of good computer programs to simulate lots of distributions. But if we have a really big high dimensional distribution of the high dimensional function like pi of the kind that comes up in a Bayesian inference problem or in many other applications, there's just no way that we know to write a nice simple computer program that just generates independent vectors which have the right probabilities. So what do we do? Well, instead we can use Markov chain Monte Carlo, okay? So, um, uh, and in particular we can use the, well, the, I'll say the general idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo, as you probably know, is that we define a Markov chain, meaning sort of a random process or random rules for getting the new vector from the previous vector, in such a way that it will converge to the distribution that we want. And if you haven't seen MCMC before, you might say, how could it be easier to design this random process than it is just to do estimates directly? But it turns out it is. And the most common and oldest and most uh, uh, widely used way of doing that is the Metropolis algorithm. And maybe I'll ask just by a show of hands, those who I can see, which is still a minority of you and you're encouraged to turn on your camera, but those I can see who has who would say you uh, you already know about the Metropolis algorithm? Just to give me an idea how to proceed here. So some hands up, but not all. Okay, well, that's fine. So it's sort of a, a mix and that's good. So I will, again, I'll illustrate that. I won't spend too long on it, but here's a very simple Metropolis algorithm for this very simple example, right? So the height of the bars is given by the, these blue bars and we're gonna run a Metropolis algorithm. It's, it's a two-step procedure. First of all, it's going to propose to move. So this black dot is going to represent our markup chain, which is moving among these six different points. 
And the rule I made is going to propose each time either to add one or to subtract one to the current location. And then it's going to just, so I'll have it do that. It's doing it randomly, by the way. So in this case, it proposed to um, subtract one and move to four. And then it has to decide whether to accept or reject this proposed move to four. And the rule is you look at pi of the new state, so pi of four, and divide that by pi of five, five of the old state. If the new state has a bigger pi, then you always accept the move. If it has a smaller pi, then you accept by the ratio of how big this bar is to this bar. So in this case, it's almost as big. It's about equal to what, 90% or something. So there's about a 90% chance it's going to accept it. And it did, it turned green. And that means the black bar moves over to four and then we start again. So if I run it again, it's gonna propose, okay, in this case, it proposed to move to three. That looks like about maybe 65% of the way up. So there's about a 65% chance it will accept it. It did accept it. And I'll let it keep going while I talk. So it's gonna propose. And if it gets to a bigger pie, it always accepts it. Um, hopefully eventually it'll reject one. Um, here's proposing to go back. Okay, it rejected that one. It had about maybe a 50% chance of accepting. Here about maybe a 60% chance it rejected again. So sometimes it'll reject, sometimes it'll accept. That time it accepted. And when it accepts, the dot moves to the new state. When it rejects, then it stays where it is. So, and uh, while it's running, let me introduce one more ingredient here, which is the black bars, which is what you could call the empirical distribution. And that is what fraction of the time has this black dot, this markup chain spent at each of these states so far? So, so far it's spent lots of time at the state two, a reasonable amount at the state one, a little bit at three, four, and five, and it hasn't been to six at all. So I hope that's clear enough. And again, it sounds like most of you already knew the Metropolis algorithm. So it's proposing, and then it's accepting or rejecting. Let me run it faster. So it's proposing and accepting or rejecting, and then it keeps on repeating this algorithm. And what happens after the long run? Well, we can look at what fraction of the time it's spending at each of these states. And of course, the point, as I think a lot of you will know, is that if I run it maybe even a little faster, that over time, the fraction of time it spends at each of these states, represented by the black bars, will converge to the target probability represented by the blue bars. It's not doing great right now because two got a little too big. I told you it's running randomly, so let me run it faster. Uh, I have to go quite a bit faster to overcome that. So I'm going to warp speed now. As we go to warp speed, it's proposing, it's accepting or rejecting. It's not off to an amazing start. Six is still too low. Two is still too big. But over time, I'm confident that if I waited long enough, the black bars would converge to the blue bars. Let me slow it down a little more now. And what's the point of that is that um, this is MCMC in a nutshell. And again, it seems like most of you have seen it before, but if you haven't, you say, well, we'd like to compute averages and probabilities according to the blue bars, but maybe that's hard. Here it's easy, but on a big complicated example, that's hard because there's a, you know, a big complicated example. We don't know how to integrate. We don't know how to do numerical integration, but no problem for running this markup chain. We just propose and then accept and reject. And over time, if we average the values from this markup chain, we'll get a very similar answer to the true average that we would have gotten from pi. So I hope that's, uh, that's clear enough. Um, I could pause now if there's any questions because uh, really the most useful thing I could tell you today is what's the Metropolis algorithm if you didn't already know, but everyone clear enough on that? Um, just a quick question. Yeah, so the proposing uh, like a state, like it's just uniform over all states like at each time, um, so the, the way I designed it is that in, in each case, it proposes to add or subtract one from the current state with probability of half each. I could make other choices and I'll come back to that. And by the way, I didn't say, but if it tries to propose, for example, to zero, it will always reject because pi of zero equals zero. But the way I did it is proposing plus or minus one each time. But you're actually a little bit anticipating where I'm going to go with this because we could have other versions. In fact, why don't I uh, go ahead and create a new version? Here's a new version, which proposes to add or subtract one or two each time. And then it still has the same rule for accepting or rejecting, but it proposes to add or subtract one or two, each with probability a quarter each time. And let's say if I, if I zero the counts and start again and maybe run this a little faster. So now it's the same kind of thing. It's proposing and then it's accepting or rejecting. But in this case, it's um, proposing from a different rule. It's probability a quarter to add or subtract one or two each time. Again, I'm confident that if I run this long enough and fast enough, the black bars will converge to the blue bars. So there are a lot of choices in the so-called proposal distribution, which I'll come back to. But any other questions for now? Okay. So um, so going back to the slides, so we can say, okay, so that's the Metropolis algorithm in a nutshell. And you know, magically it converges. And um, so yeah, and this I could say, you know, it's extremely popular, as probably most of you know. So the Metropolis algorithm and other markup chain Monte Carlo or MCMC. -MC, 
is used in Bayesian statistical inference all the time and in lots of areas of computer science, as I think you know, and in lots of other areas too, from physics to finance to engineering and more. So, um, but then we can say, and this gets back to uh, Ali's question, how do you choose this proposal distribution? So because of Markov chain theory, so Markov chain theory says, well, this acceptance rule, this magic probability of always accept if pi of y is bigger than pi of x, otherwise accept with the ratio of pi of y over pi of x. This magic rule was chosen very carefully such that this Markov chain is what's called being a reversible with respect to pi, which some of you may know, which means that pi is a stationary distribution. And it'll also almost always have the properties of irreducible and aperiodic if you remember your Markov chain theory. And that's how I knew the black bars would converge to the blue bars. And I know that for both the, um, both the, uh, uh, you know, the, the plus or minus one version or the plus or minus two version. So I've actually got lots of choices. And so I'll go back to the simulation, although I already did this a bit. So let's say I zero the counts and start again. So I'm doing plus or minus one or two each time. And I'm pretty confident the black bars will eventually converge to the blue bars. But why stop there? I could do plus or minus, oops, I did the wrong thing. I could do plus or minus one or two or three each time, right? So this time it's each time proposing with probability one six, I set it up to be to add or subtract one or two or three from the current state and then do the accept reject rule, same as before. If it's going to a bigger pi, then you always accept. If it's a smaller pi, you accept with the ratio of pi of the new state over pi of the old state. And this is a pretty good markup chain. And if I run this for a while, I'm again convinced that the black bars will eventually converge to the blue bars. And again, why stop there? Maybe I could do plus or minus one, two, three, or four, right? So right away, even for this very simple example where we didn't really need a markup chain, but if we do run a markup chain, which choice is the best, right? And um, so I told you, I'm confident that in any of these cases, the black bars will eventually converge to the blue bars, but well, what do we mean by the best? Roughly speaking, we mean how quickly will the black bars converge to the blue bars, right? We, we're not gonna run this for an infinite amount of time. And as you know, we wanna run things as efficiently as possible. We wanna know how long do we have to run this markup chain until it does approximately converge to the target. And you could ask which one is best, right? So I've shown you a plus or minus one or plus or minus one or two or plus or minus one, two or three, plus or minus one, two, three or four. And for that matter, I could continue it farther too, right? I did the wrong thing again. Let me go up to, let me go up to plus or minus one, I'll do a little slower. Now it's doing plus or minus one or two or three or four or five all the way up to 10, okay? So it's doing plus or minus. So that time was pretty good. It moved from four to one, but sometimes it proposes a value which is right off the screen. You don't even see it. And then it doesn't accept either. So right away, we sort of have a question and uh, maybe I'll throw it out to a vote. Those of you who did put your camera on and again, you're all invited to put your camera on, but those of you who did, if you want, you can just signal with your hand whether if you had to choose one of these markup chains, how big a plus or minus, I sometimes call it the, uh, the radius or, or the gamma in this case, but would you want just plus or minus one or plus or minus one or two, plus or minus one, two or three, four or so on, all the way up to plus or minus, all the way up to 10. I'll let you choose what you think would be the best. If you're willing, those whose cameras are on, show me a one, two, three, four, whatever. I see a one from uh, Steven, two from Graham, two from Tim, uh, three from Murat. Okay, uh, two from Ali. Okay, well, thanks those who participated. So it's interesting, you're mostly liking the small radiuses. So in fact, a lot of you like one. Let's go back to one just for a second and uh, run that a little faster. So plus or minus one, well, it does have some advantages. For example, it'll probably accept the most proposals, right? Because it won't often propose off the edge of the state space to zero or seven or beyond. But on the other hand, well, we started at one. In fact, there's a good illustration. Well, it's getting a little bit worse as an illustration, but it took a while to get away from where it started at one or two or three and move along, right? So especially on a very big complicated space, if we just did plus or minus a small proposal, it might take a while to get where it's going, even though the acceptance rate would be big. Whereas at the other extreme, I'll go back up for a second to plus or minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Well, now it's proposing, um, plus or minus, and it's often proposing right off the edge of the screen, right? So, so it's interesting, most of you shy away from that. So you can see that you don't wanna propose things that are too big because you'll usually reject them. But as I say, maybe you don't wanna propose things that are too small because you'll usually uh, accept them. So in this case, well, actually the target was generated randomly. So it depends a little bit which of these blue bar examples we choose, but roughly speaking, I think the best choice is, is actually four. So plus or minus one, two, three, or four, because then it has a good chance of moving around but it still doesn't reject that many. But, but anyway, it, it depends on the example and one or two are pretty good too. But in terms of general principles, because this is just a simple example, 
what can we say? Well, we don't want to propose things that are way too big because they'll usually reject them. But also, and maybe this wasn't as obvious, we might not want to propose things that are too small because it might take a long time to move around. And, and in terms of the acceptance rate or the fraction of proposals that get accepted, well, if it's hardly ever accepting because it's proposing big things, that's bad. And I think you could all see that. But if it's almost always accepting, that maybe also isn't so great because it means you're just proposing small moves and it'll take you a long time to get anywhere. So we'll come back to that, but that's kind of the theme here is what's the best choice of these things. So just about any proposal will work, what's the best choice? Well, um, yeah, so one thing I started to say is the acceptance rate. So if the acceptance rate is close to zero, in other words, you're almost always rejecting your proposals, you probably don't have a very good uh, markup chain because after all, it's, um, it's just gonna stay where it is. It just rejects all the time. But also if your acceptance rate is close to one, that might seem good for a little while until you think about how did you achieve that? And you probably achieved it by being very conservative, right? So I call this size the Goldilocks principle. You probably know the story of Goldilocks. Things should be not too hot, not too cold, but just right. Well, it's the same thing with these uh, 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 proposal radius or how to run the markup chain. We wanna propose things that aren't too big, aren't too small, they're just right. Or the acceptance rate should be not close to zero, not close to one, but just right. And interestingly, there's actually some theory about this under some quite restrictive conditions and taking the dimension to infinity and looking at limiting diffusions and something that I worked on some, but I won't get into too much as it today, but it actually says, you know what? In a certain case, the optimal acceptance rate, it's far from zero and it's far from one, but it actually shouldn't be close to a half, should be about a quarter, it should be about 0.234 to three decimal points in a certain limit. So that's an interesting optimality thing. It says one way to tell if you've got a good scaling is if you're hardly ever accepting, that's bad. But if you're almost always accepting, that's bad too. If you're accepting about a quarter of the time, that's good. And also there's other theory that again, I won't get into, but it says in a higher dimensional problem, it's not just a question of how big you want your steps to be, but what sort of a shape you want your probabilities to be. If you think in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, covariance matrix, that is, do you want to just uh, make the first coordinate really big and the second one really small? Or do you want them independent of each other? Or do you want them to be dependent? So there's a lot of issues there. And it turns out again, in this special limit under some strong assumptions, there's provides some guidance and it says, maybe the proposal covariance should actually be proportional to the target covariance matrix. In other words, the covariance of pi, if pi is a multi-dimensional distribution. So I won't get into this too much right now, but it'll sort of guide us in the back of our minds because it says there's actually some interesting theory about how to make the markup chain work well. But is it great? Well, maybe this theory isn't so great in some senses. And that's where the um, adaptive metropolis, which is what this talk is about, comes into it. So, so how can we make use of this information? We say, well, there's this theory which says, you know, maybe you should have a certain acceptance rate. Maybe you should have a certain proposal scaling and shape. That's great theory, but here's the problem. So we don't know in advance what markup chain will lead to a good acceptance rate, right? We could run a markup chain and see what the acceptance rate is, but we don't know. And if it's a bad acceptance rate, what do we do? Maybe we try again with a different proposal. And especially if we say we wanna do the, sh the proposal shape proportional to the target covariance matrix, well, we don't know what that is. Pi, the target distribution is a big complicated thing. We don't know what's a good choice for uh, pi. We don't know how to understand the proposal covariance matrix. So, but then, Here's where it gets interesting because if we had to, if we happen to already have a good sample, that is, suppose we had a friend who ran a really good markup chain for us and it gave us really good samples from Pi. Then we say, well, thanks a lot. From those good samples, we can estimate things like the target covariance matrix. And once we know things like we know these things about the target, then we could use that information to run a good metropolis algorithm. And once we had a good metropolis algorithm, we could get good samples. So they call this the chicken and egg problem, as you can probably see. It's sort of like saying, if we had really good samples, then we'd know what's the best way to run a markup chain and we'd know how to run a markup chain to get really good samples. But how do we get the good samples in the first place? And that's where, you know, a lot of people will do it by trial and error. And that's the typical way MCMC is run. You, you start some version of the Metropolis algorithm, you run it, you say, gee, it doesn't seem to be working that good. We got bad acceptance, it's really getting stuck well, let's try changing it around and let's run it again. And this one's a little better, but it's not too good. And, and you try to do that, but that's pretty hard in high dimensions, right? It's a, sort of a trial and error and running lots of things. What's better is to let the computer decide. And I certainly don't have to convince a crowd from the Vector Institute that 
computers can help us to learn certain things. So, so uh, here's a more formal way to talk about adaptive MCMC or the adaptive metropolis algorithm. It says, suppose we don't just have one metropolis algorithm, we have a whole family of them. So I wrote it as sort of P sub gamma indexed by gamma. And the example to keep in mind from our six, uh, six uh, point space is we could have done the version which always proposes plus or minus one or the version which proposes plus or minus one or two and so on, right? So I'll index that by gamma, which you could think of as that gamma. Is it one or two or three and so on? And we don't know which one's the best. Now in this small example, we can kind of eyeball it, but in a big complicated example, we don't know which one's best. So for the nth update, that is the nth time, we, we the nth step of this markup chain, let's choose, I'll write P sub capital gamma N meaning gamma n is a random variable chosen from the space of all possible markup chains. And it's learning, I'll put that in quotes. We have many different meanings of learning, but I don't have to convince Vector Institute people that computers can learn things in some sense. And we can say, well, we have various adaptive rules. So let me run that again. So suppose we said, here's our simple example. I'll zero the count. And we'd like to run, in fact, let me just get a new version of the target. So, oh, that one's an interesting one because it's got a really big value of five. Maybe that's too interesting for right now. Okay, that's, uh, I don't know, I'm never sure which example I like best. It does them randomly. Um, all right, let's try that one. So we say, um, okay, we're going to try to run it, but we don't know if it should do, you know, the plus or minus one each time or plus or minus one or two, plus or minus one, two or three. So I'm going to click yes for adapting. I'm going to make it run an adaptive rule. And what's this adaptive rule? It's gonna say, well, we're trying to figure out what's our best choice of plus or minus one, or sorry, of, of, of plus or minus one, two, three up to gamma. What's our best choice of gamma? And you know what? I'm not sure what to do. So I'll let the computer update as it goes. And I could make up any rule, but since it's a simple example, let me make up a simple rule and say, well, here's what I do. I'll do the first one. So it's gonna propose, okay. And it accepted it. And then it moves over. And then the logic is, Every time it accepts a move, that kind of makes it seem like it's pretty easy to accept a move, or at least it hints it might be easy. So then we'll increase that value of gamma. So I didn't change it, but it's uh, gonna this time do a plus or minus one or two because it accepted, okay? Now it proposed to go back. You know what, it's probably gonna accept that too because it's going to a bigger pie. Now it's gonna say, you know, this is easy. I'll do plus or minus one, two, or three. Um, oh, if you have to, it's gonna accept that one too because it went to two. Uh, it's gonna, so now it's gonna say, and I'm not making it do this, it's gonna say, you know what, let's do plus or minus one, two, three, or four. And um, so you know what, we say, um, uh, that's okay, it'll keep going now. And now it proposed again, okay, it re finally rejected, although it could have accepted a six, but it rejected. Then it says, okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, I'll go back to just plus or minus one, two, or three, okay? And then I'll let it run on its own, and it continues that way. So I'm not touching anything, it proposes, um, oh, it rejected that one. Now it'll shrink back. It'll go back to just plus or minus one. Um, oh, it accepted that one. Now it'll go to plus or minus one or two. Okay. And that's the logic. Now it'll go to plus or minus one, two, or three. And let me just run it faster. So now it's saying, you know what? We don't need to eyeball or try to figure out what's the best choice of this gamma, plus or minus one, two, three, whatever. We'll let it adjust as it goes. So now it's up to, what is it? Plus or minus one, two, three, up to six, I think it is. Now it's down to five. And as it gets bigger, then it starts to reject more, right? Because it's proposing off the edge of the screen. Then it starts to reject, so it starts to shrink it again. And now it's back to plus or minus, what, one, two, or three, I think, one, two, three, or four. And it's adjusting as it goes. So, you know, I'll let it go a little faster. And the point is, I didn't need to try to figure out what the big scale, what the right scaling should be. It just did it. Now, again, in this small example, we really didn't need this machinery, but imagine a high dimensional example. There's no way to picture it. There's no way to graph it because it's in, you know, high dimensions, maybe 22 dimensions or whatever. And we say, we don't know what kind of a proposal we should use, but it can learn. And it can learn not just how big a proposal, like in this example, but it can estimate the target covariance, like I said, based on the sample it gets, and that can help it to learn. So that's the idea of adaptive MCMC or adaptive metropolis. And then you, there's two obvious questions that you could ask. One you could say is, well, does this adaption really help us find better Markov chains? And that I think I can confidently say, yes, we have examples where, you know, it's high dimensional. You'd never be able to tune it by hand and eyeball it, but you run it simple adaptive algorithms and, you know, they do a lot better. But a more important question maybe is we've tweaked the algorithm. Will it still converge to pi? Uh, 
And that one, I also know the answer. And the answer is sometimes. And that's where the theory comes in, which is more my side of things. And it says, is this really OK? So that's what I want to get into. Well, actually, first, I'll talk about the first question. So just quickly show some examples. So here's an example, which is a 100 dimensional example that I ran as a simulation. And what is this showing? So I ran it for a million iterations. So the x-axis is just the iteration number n. So n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, up to a million. And the y-axis is showing the value of just the first coordinate of these 100 dimensional vectors that are being randomly updated. And at first, this just looks like a crazy blob. I realize that. But if you look at it closer, it's actually got some interesting structure. Because if you look at the first part, you say, well, it's just doing uh, plus or minus just a little bit here. It's pretty close to 0, and it never gets too far from 0. Then it starts to get a little farther from 0. And then by the time you get to about three or 400,000, which is around here, then it starts jumping around more, right? And it's really going between about plus or minus 1 or so. And here's what you were seeing here, that from about 300,000 on, this part here, this is a great metropolis algorithm. This is MCMC at its finest. This is taking a 100 dimensional example. It's sampling well from it. It's mixing all around. You know, The black bars are converting to the blue bars. We're getting a really good sample. And any kind of estimates or expected values we took from this, they'd be really, really good. This is a really bad Markov chain. This is a Markov chain that's getting stuck. It's not converging to the right thing at all. It's getting stuck too close to 0. And this is a learning period here. So the Markov chain is gradually learning based on the crummy samples it has so far. It's learning a little more about the target structure. And then it says, once we have this better understanding, then we can run a better Markov chain. So this, in a nutshell, is if, you know, the more you look at it, quite convincing evidence for the use of adaptive metropolis to try to improve our Markov chain. Um, for that same example, because we knew what the right answer was, we could plot something we call the suboptimality factor, which is just how much worse is the current version of the Markov chain compared to the optimal version. And you can see it starts out way worse. So it's you know, maybe a few hundred times worse. So way worse than it's maybe 60 times worse, 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 worse. And then it gradually learns. And again, by about 300,000 or so, it gets down close to one, which means it's essentially doing the optimal choice among the uh, Gaussian random walk metropolis, which is the, the family that we use here. But it's you know, a very general family, and it's doing about the best you could possibly imagine. But it took a few hundred thousand iterations to learn. Okay. And here's the same thing in uh, 200 dimensions. And it's very similar, so I won't spend too long on it. But you can see it takes about a million iterations of running a bad Markov chain before it finally learns enough. And from here, we can test and it's running a really good Markov chain. Okay. So this simple idea of letting the computer adapt as it goes actually makes the Markov chain converge much better. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. Will it actually converge to the right answer? So regular metropolis algorithm, as I already kind of said, I was sure the black bars were going to converge to the blue bars eventually because I studied markup chains, right? And markup chain theory, which some of you have studied, says if you have nice properties like irreducibility and aperiodicity, which are no problem here, and if pi is a stationary distribution of the Markov chain, which is guaranteed because of the definition of the metropolis algorithm with that rule for the acceptance rejection rate, it's going to converge, no problem. But now we started doing this adaptive thing, right? Which is the number one thing you cannot do for a Markov chain. You can't look back at your history. You have to just update based on the current state. So we destroyed all those nice Markov properties that for the last 100 years, everyone's been using to prove Markov chains converge. Does it really matter? You could say, you know, look, each individual choice still converges. So what's the problem? Well, it seems like it might not matter. And if I go back to this example, it seems like it's converging pretty well, even with the adapting. But let me change it. Let me slow it down, first of all. And then um, let me change to a new example, a um, slightly more artificial example. It's still an example on six points. But this one is not choosing randomly. It's one that I chose, where each of states 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6 have the same probability, which is just under 1 fifth. But then 2, I don't know if you can even see this tiny little blue spot here. This corresponds to just a tiny little bit of pi of 2. And then I'm still going to run the, um, the I'll, say, I'll start the radius back at 1. And I'll run the, sorry, the uh, plus or minus 1 algorithm from before, but with the adaption. So it does plus or minus 1 the first time. It accepted. Now it's going to do plus or minus 2. Oh, it rejected. Goes back to plus or minus 1. Um, it accepted, goes back to plus or minus one or two, and so on. And I think uh, you know we're pretty familiar with it by now. Let me run it a little faster. And it still seems like it's OK. And you know it may have trouble getting to one, but sometimes it'll jump over and get to one as well. That's not necessarily a problem. 
But at some point, we're going to see a terrible problem. And it might take a little while, so I might have to run this a little faster, make it happen. But I, I want to make, I'm just adjusting the speed now. I'm not adjusting anything else. And actually, it's not doing well in the sense that it didn't manage to jump to one yet. But yeah, there it eventually jumped to one. And then, OK, it jumped away from one. So it'll sometimes jump to one, sometimes jump away from one. Um, it's possible it'll jump to two, but that's very unlikely because pi of two is so small, it'll usually reject. But you know, it can jump over. OK, it got to one again. But OK, here, it just finally happened again. I didn't make this happen. What happened is it was jumping around with different plus or minus ones, whatever. And eventually, it happened to get to one, no problem. And then it happened to reject a few times, no problem. But now it's in a bit of a bind. So I'll run it a little slower. What's it doing? It's in one, and it's got down to just doing plus or minus one. When it proposes to go to zero, it always rejects. So then it just stays at plus or minus one. You can't get any lower than that. But if it goes to two, it almost always rejects anyway, because pi of two is so small. So it's staying at one. And even if I make this run a lot faster, it's proposing a lot of plus or minus ones, but it's almost always rejecting them. And indeed, in the limit, as this pi of two gets really small, and then as I run the markup chain for a long time, it's actually going to converge to the black bar at one going up to one and all the other black bars going up to zero if I run that faster. So I, you, know, you have to appreciate how bad the situation this is for those of us working on adaptive MCMC. Because with MCMC, we always took for granted the black bars will eventually converge to the blue bars. We're just trying to figure out how fast or how to make it converge faster. But now in our zeal to make it converge faster, we actually created a situation where the black bars will not converge to the blue bars at all. And I mean, even though I've known about this example for, for, for years now, I still find it pretty fascinating because, you know, just to be clear, even if we just did plus or minus one all the time, the black bars would eventually converge to the blue bars. Now it might take a while because when it was a one, it would take a long time to accept it two and get out. But then when it was out here, it would take a long time to accept it two and come back to one. And it would balance out in the long run. But with the adaptive scheme, when you're at three, four, five, six, you might accept and get big jumps. And once you have a big jump, you might jump to one. But then if you reject a few times, you might get trapped. So there's a trap on this side, which is not a trap over here. So it completely breaks the symmetry because we're changing the rules as we go. So from the theory point of view, this is a major note of caution. It says, yeah, all your fancy adaption techniques, don't, don't be so confident in them because even though any individual choice of the piece of gammas of these markup chains the black bars would eventually converge to the blue bars. Even a bad choice here, like plus or minus one, eventually it would converge. But with this adaptive structure, now it's easier to get into this trap and hard to get out of this trap. It's actually converging to the wrong thing. Okay. So let's say goodbye to our example, but it says uh, it actually makes a big difference. So what to do? In other words, um, you know, we'd really like to use this adaption because it really seems to improve things in a way that you know, human trial and error can't really do, but it can totally mess up the markup chain thing. One thing you can do, and in practice, it's a pretty good uh, scheme, and I've worked on it some with a PhD student, is to say, you know what, let's just adapt for a while. We'll adapt for a while until we get what we think is a pretty good choice of the markup chain, and then stop adapting and just do regular MCMC. In fact, I'm inv involved in an applied uh, collaboration now where they're doing exactly that. They're saying, adapt it for a while, get a pretty good markup chain, and then just fix it. And once you fix a markup chain, now we're back to good old markup chain theory, good old MCMC, just like before. So we just had an initial phase of learning, and then we stopped learning, and we did it. So that's probably pretty smart in practice. But I don't love this solution, first of all, because I work on the theory of what happens if you don't stop adapting. I think it's pretty interesting, and I'll tell you about it next. But, but also because how do you know when you've done enough adapting, right? You say, well, I'll do enough adapting to get a good markup chain, and now I'll run it. But in a big complicated example, how do you know you've got a really good markup chain? And um, we, we introduced these adaptive diagnostics where you kind of look at the statistical analysis of the output of your chain, but that's just a, a, a heuristic and you could mess up. So, so what I think is better is to do some theory to find some conditions with guarantee that the black bars will converge to the blue bars. In other words, the probabilities, even with this adaptive markup chain, that they'll convert, that they'll be in any subset should converge to what the target probability should be. And I'll just talk briefly about it, but I'm happy to talk more in the question. So here's one theorem, maybe I'll start here for a second, um, that I proved, and it's some time ago now, but it's actually been pretty useful, especially with its various, uh, various uh, variants and generalizations. But it says, the black bars will converge to the blue bars if you have two properties. And the first one is pretty simple and it's kind of the key. And it says, we call this uh, diminishing adaptation. And it says that, um, as the algorithm proceeds, you do less and less adapting. So 
More formally, you can say here, P sub gamma n, these are the Markov chain transitions that we do at time n. And P sub gamma n plus one, these are the Markov chain transitions we do at time n plus one. And we look at that difference and sort of take the, the worst case of that difference. And if that's going to zero in probability, because that's a random variable, because it depends on the adaption, then that's diminishing adaptation. So in the context of this example that we're mostly done with now, but if I said, I'm not always going to change the plus or minuses by one every time, I'm only going to do it, let's say, with a certain probability, which is diminishing. So I'll, I'll adjust the pluses, minuses as I go. But after a while, I'll sort of stop adjusting them so much. I don't ever have to stop adjusting them. I can adjust them infinitely many times, but less and less frequently, let's say. Then that would be fine. So that's diminishing adaptation. And that is pretty much sufficient. So it's sort of nearly sufficient. However, on infinite state spaces, unlike that six point example, there's a technical second condition, which we call, call the containment. And it says it's a little technical, but the intuition is, well, one way to say it is we want to avoid a sort of escape to infinity. So what could go wrong with adaptive MCMC? One thing, in addition to the, the fact that, you know, because you're adapting, you sort of break the symmetry, but is that maybe you, you start off with a bad choice of a Markov chain. So that gives you some bad samples. And then you try to learn from those samples, but your learning is so bad, you get a worse Markov chain. And then that gives you worse samples. And then you learn from those and get a worse Markov chain and worse samples. So you kind of escape off to infinity in the sense of worse and worse Markov chains. And containment is just a formal way of, of um, preventing that. It's saying that if you look at, given your current choice of Markov chain and your current state that you're at, how long would it take you to converge to within epsilon of the right answer? In other words, for the black bars to converge to the blue bars with this particular Markov chain in this particular state. And those have to remain bounded in probability. So they're not kind of getting worse and worse and worse and going off to infinity. So if you have a finite state space or some compactness conditions or some tail conditions, then this is no problem. And in that, the uh, six point example is no problem. In general, it almost always is satisfied, but it's hard to verify. So if you're in a simple state space, you just need diminishing adaptation. And that's no problem because you can just make that happen by the rule that you choose. If you're in a complicated state space, you have to deal with this containment. Um, and once you have those conditions, it proves lots of nice properties, including different versions of adaption we've looked at, like somewhere you have a bunch of coordinates and you adapt uh, one of them at a time. Sorry, you, you update one of them at a time with certain probabilities, but then you change the adaption probabilities. So you update some of them more often and some of them less often. There's lots of different things you can do and they all follow from this theorem. If you can verify this containment, and that always bugged me, so I won't spend long on it because I want to wrap up soon, but I'll just say, maybe I'll uh, stretch this whole thing out. I, we call this adaptive MCMC for everyone or containment condition for everyone that we had this technical condition. And then by proving some general theorems about what we called adversarial Markov chains, we eventually were able to prove some sufficient conditions that if you have some control on your Markov chains that it, things, it never jumps more than a certain big distance and it doesn't adapt when you're way out in the tails and it has certain continuity properties, that was enough to prove that you would have this containment property. So finally, we can stop worrying about this weird technical condition, as long as you satisfied some fairly mild, even, even if kind of uh, clunky conditions that you can make happen in practice. And on something like a finite state space, these wouldn't be a problem. So, so we say, okay, basically we now have a way of handling containment and that together with diminishing adaptation means we can at least ensure that the black bars will converge to the blue bars. And to us, that's like a hunting license. It says, you know what? You can use uh, any adaptive scheme that you want as long as it satisfies a few simple properties. We know it'll be asymptotically valid. And then you can use your own creativity and your own knowledge of the problem that you're working on to try to make the adaption smart so that they learn how to do good, uh, good markup chains. Okay. So I think I'm gonna just uh, sum up because I wanna leave time for discussion and questions. Uh, but I mean, I'm happy to go into more detail, obviously, about a lot of these things. But if there's only one thing you learned from the talk, I hope you learned about the Metropolis algorithm. It sounds like a lot of you knew about it already. But the Metropolis algorithm, it's you know, this wonderful, simple algorithm. It's very useful for estimating these expected values in all sorts of contexts. Um, but then my particular interest for this talk is this adaptive uh, MCMC or the adaptive metropolism, metropolism algorithm here which is saying, well, we'd like to get the computer to help us learn how to sample better. And again, on a high dimensional complicated problem that can be really useful.
And so, you know, we had various examples in high dimensions, including, uh, you know, to mention a couple hundred and more where, you know, it takes a little while, but you run the Markov chain, it gradually gets better samples, gradually learns how to run a better Markov chain, and that helps it learn better samples, and eventually it runs really well. Um, it is subtle, so hopefully you got the point of the six-point state space to say you can do very simple adaptive rules on what seems like a very simple and valid uh, example of, of uh, Metropolis algorithm, but it can completely destroy stationarity. The black bars are not converging to the blue bars. That's bad. So then we have various theorems, including this one that says if you have the uh, diminishing adaptation, which is a fundamental thing, which is important, but you can make it happen just by using the right adaption rules. And then this technical condition of containment, which is usually satisfied, um, but could be hard to verify, then that's good enough. And then, oops, my phone, I'll ignore that. And then uh, more recently, we have these um, adaptive metropolis, uh, uh, sorry, so that's enough to do convergence of adaptive metropolis and these things where you update the coordinate selection probabilities and more. And then this more recent thing where we say, well, with the adversarial, so adversarial conditions, we can verify containment. So we think that's good. And so we think that, as I say, this is kind of a hunting license to try adaptive uh, metropolis and other adaptive MCMC in lots of contexts. And now we're very happy to hear people who are trying it and happy to help out and discuss ways that adaption can work for various supply problems. Um, if you want to know more, then you know, all my papers related to this, of which I have quite a few now, and software, including the uh, JavaScript example with the six-point state space and more, is all at my webpage, uh, webpage probability.ca. So uh, I think I will wrap up my talk now because I do want to leave a little time for questions. But again, thank you for having me and thank you for letting me virtually give a talk at the Vector Institute. Now I can tell people I really work on machine learning because I've been at the Vector Institute. So uh, I'll leave it there and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, great talk. And I think we have a few questions in the chat already, so we should okay. talk about from those. I didn't see. Let's see. Can I get that without stopping share? Yeah, so, yeah. So let me start from the one that is not answered. So from Nolan. Uh, Nolan, do you want to ask a question or should I? Oh, you're right. I can ask it. I see. Yeah, there's actually quite a few in the chat. Sorry, I wasn't uh, noticing the chats. Uh, sorry, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask about, um, so in your JavaScript thing, you had like a bunch of uh, proposals. And when you set the radius to be large, a lot of those proposals went off screen. Right. Um, and I was just wondering, like, what if you just use like circular indexing? So if it goes one off screen, it just goes to the, like, the left side or something. Yeah. So in this case, that would actually be fine. Now, I mean, of course, our goal isn't to solve the six point state space, right? But you know, I'll go back to the regular target. But if, um, yeah, I mean, in, in this particular case, that would actually be totally fine. The, the key to this version of the Metropolis algorithm is just that the proposals are uh, symmetric. So in other words, you have the same chance of proposing to move from one to three as you do of proposing to move from three to one. But with your idea, you would have that, right? Because if you propose to what, add, uh, add uh, five to three, you get to eight. Or sorry, so add four to three, you get to seven, which would come back to one. If you propose to subtract one, subtract four from one, you'd come around and get to three. So, so that would be fine. And that's a good solution. Now, of course, in a real example, first of all, in a lot of the statistical examples, it's not that it, it suddenly cuts off to zero. It's more that you would have a tail, right? So uh, it would never actually go to zero. It would just be less and less probability as you go out. Um, if you had a, um, a finite example, then that might be a reasonable thing to do. Now, of course, um, in a more complicated example, even if the state space is finite, you wouldn't necessarily want to be able to propose everywhere because even still, a lot of the probabilities would be really small. So, but yeah, I mean, that's fine. If you were actually just trying to improve this particular example, then doing it kind of the addition uh, mod six or whatever it would be to, to make it be circular, yeah, would, would actually be a good solution. Yeah, thanks. I, look, I, say, I didn't notice the chat, but should I look through the chat now or? Uh... I think the uh, next question is by Kiros. Uh... Yeah, I guess uh, my question was more about uh, like, it, it, is there in some sense, uh, it, you know, are, are there adaptive strategies that are better than others? I mean, the issue of, con you know, convergence to the right distribution is obviously the, of utmost importance, but once you've got past that, um, are there, is, is there a notion of optimal adaptive strategies? Yeah, well, good question. I mean, um, part of the, I mean, first of all, you know, uh, I, I don't have, I don't have a good answer for you, but um, part of the problem, of course, is that when you talk about optimality, um, there's a question of what's the context, because obviously, if you were, um, if you were omnipotent, the best thing would be to always sample exactly from the blue bars, right? And that would be the best markup chain would be one that always exactly samples with these probabilities. And always gives you the right answer. So 
presumably when we're doing MCMC, we're saying, well, the, the blue bars are too complicated to propose from them directly. So there's a question of what we're allowed to know, right? So if you, if you were allowed, and in fact, one thing, um, you can do what's called adaptive independent sampler, which is where, um, so the um, independent sampler is a version of MCMC where the proposals are IID, but then if you're learning, then maybe you're trying to learn what the blue bars are so that you're converging towards always proposing from the blue bars, which would be the truly optimal thing to do. So that's a sense in which that would be the best asymptotic adaptive thing to do, but that's assuming you are able to learn that. So I say the problem is you have to say, um, you know, what are you allowed to do or not allowed to do, which kind of depends on how complicated the problem is. But like, uh, so, so the adaptive, like these, uh, if I go back just for a sec to these uh, graphs in 200 dimensions or whatever, they're the context, and I didn't go into too much detail, but the context was you're always doing a uh, 200 dimensional metropolis where you're always proposing from a normal distribution, which is centered at the current point. You just get to choose the uh, covariance matrix, the 200 by 200 covariance matrix. So. That was kind of a rule that, you know, with that in place, we're trying to find the optimal normal increment proposal. So, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, yeah, so I guess in turn, if you ask me, is there an optimal adaptive policy? I think if you had an optimal, if you had an adaptive policy, which learned the true blue bars and moved towards sampling perfectly IID from the blue bars, then I'd have to say that was optimal, but that's also probably not something you're able to do in practice. So it's a bit of a balance, but I mean, of course, what's behind your question is just, what's a smart way to do adaption. And that's also something we don't have a great answer for. We have a number of different examples, but partially even after it's been a number of years now, I still sort of feel like we're waiting for more applied users of MCMC to make up their own adaptive rules and we'll help to make sure it satisfies the asymptotic conditions. But you who know your problem and are smart about what markup chains are working well or not can help figure out what's a good way to adapt for your problem. So, so it's a good question with a lot of layers to it, but not the other question was better than the answer, but uh, thank you. Um, okay, and then uh, should I go through the chat or I guess Murat? Yeah, I think this that question is by uh, Graham. Yeah, yeah Graham. this was on the uh, the situation where you got stuck on that one. Uh, right. And I was saying, well, it seemed to me like the problem was that there was uh, zero probability on 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 the, this on, on a number of states, and so if you had non-zero probability on some of those states, sorry. <coughs> That might solve the problem. So I was suggesting something like a mixture of a uniform right. over all the states, and then this sort of like window distribution that's adapting could right. that solve the issue? Yeah. So that is a good idea, and um, actually, you have some versions related to that are things that we've actually done. So I mean, of course, again, this was just illustrative of the problems that could arise. But as far as uh, solutions, I mean, of course, in this case, it's it still has a chance of accepting from two, but just a small chance. Um, yeah. Actually, I guess. Let me be a little careful. Like in this case, even if you could, let's say you say, you know, with probability 99%, I'm going to do the plus or minus adaptive thing, but with probably 1%, I'll sample uniformly from all these. To be honest, I guess that wouldn't really solve this particular trap, would it? Because um, you'd still have the problem. And let's say instead of 1%, it was, you know, one chance in a thousand or whatever, that you still have the problem that most of the time it would still proceed according to this trap. And then you'd have one chance in a thousand of getting out of the trap, but you'd have a much better chance of getting back into the trap too. So, um, because I mean, even in this case, there's a chance of getting out of the trap if you happen to accept a proposal of the two. It just doesn't happen very often. So yeah, actually, I guess whereas at first I was going to say, yeah, that would be a good way to solve this trap. But this particular trap, I actually don't think would be solved by that. Because even if you said, you know, one time in a thousand, you just go from a simple uniform. It does mean that when you're stuck here, you have one chance in a thousand or whatever, or, um, or maybe a few chances in a thousand, whatever, of, of getting out of the trap. And then you'll be happy for a while. But still, you'll be quicker to go back into the trap because you don't need to wait for that one in a thousand to go back to the trap. You just need to wait for it to get out. So actually I'm thinking that wouldn't be enough to solve the problem, although it's still a smart thing. And in some of the cases, in fact, it's related to the containment condition, which I didn't get into too much, but the containment condition in some examples can be helped by having a small chance of doing a fixed thing. Cause that means you won't get a worse and worse chain escaping off to infinity because you still get some good samples that help to keep you sane. So. Anyway, that's another good question with a lot of uh, elements to it, but thanks, Graeme. Thank you. Uh, next question is by Rosina. Yes, sure. So again, I had uh, like a question about the same situation. I was wondering if we keep a history of how the samples were changing. Would that solve the issue? Because then I know that I got stuck here and now it's time to like use the knowledge I had from previous samples. 
Right. Well, yeah, I mean, that question is really in the spirit of adaptive MCMC, right? Because adaptive MCMC is here. We're remembering what's happened so far and we're trying to learn from it. I think it's kind of what you're saying. And you're right. In this case, you could say, you know, we learned that the state one is really a bit of a problem. It's kind of a trap for us. So maybe we learned that if you're in the state one, you should always have a certain chance of jumping to the state three, let's say. And uh, so that is good. I mean, um, from the theory point of view, that doesn't really solve the problem because you're doing even more adapting in the sense of conditioning on what happened before. And, you know, we're not sure. I mean, I mean, obviously this is a, an artificial example and in a real example, we probably wouldn't have this particular trap, but the general idea that you do adaptions which seem sensible, but they could also cause asymptotic problems, that doesn't go away. But I mean, if you take your question as more from a practical point of view, what's a smart way to design the adaption so that it learns and doesn't get stuck in traps as much, then I think that's a great idea. And uh, in particular, you know, if you had some example, let's say that was a, a harder, higher dimensional, more realistic example, but seemed to have some traps in it, or you were just worried it might have a trap in it because you might not know, then you say, well, you know what, I'm going to put in some other rules. And if we've been stuck in the same area for a little while, then we put in a new rule that we can jump out. That could well be a sensible thing to do. Um, in order to make sure that the black bars still converge to the blue bars, you'd still have to check some of the conditions, I think. But but nonetheless, from the point of view of making something that works in a smart way and avoids problems, I think that's a great idea. And again, a great example of a case where it might depend on what your particular application is and what you're involved in and kind of learning what the traps are and learning rules to get out of them. I think that could be could be great. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tim? Oh, yeah, I was just wondering. So like, we know that Metropolis still does like a random walk, so it might not necessarily be efficient in high dimensions. So I was uh, wondering about adaption for algorithms that avoid the random walk. Right, yeah, well, I mean, um, our, our theory about adaption is not specific to random walk or even specific to Metropolis, right? It just has certain conditions of the markup chain. So we feel that they are, you know, right for use in many other field, in many other approaches, including HMC, which you mentioned, and uh, some other ones. Um, there, I'm trying to think if there's, I definitely was talking to somebody about adapting HMC specifically, but I'm trying to think if they had a method or if we were just talking, I think we were just talking about it, but uh, that, yeah, so I'm not quite sure if, if anyone has looked at that too carefully yet, but I think it's a great idea. And yeah, people are using HMC a lot now, as you know, and um, it's also, I think, ripe for adapting. And so, yeah, I think it'd be a great project to look at HMC and see how adaptions can improve it. And Again, I would say that part of the struggle would be thinking, well, for HMC, what's a smart rule for adaption that can find a way to learn from the past samples in a smart way to improve it? And then from the theory point of view, can we check that it still satisfies those basic conditions so we're not messing things up too badly? But yeah, I'm trying to think, I feel bad now because I was definitely talking to somebody about that and I can't remember if they had a good idea or if we were just saying somebody should do it someday. So uh, I can't quite remember now, but I think it's a great idea. And if you are working on HMC and you wanted to, uh, try out some sort of ways of adapting, then I'd be very interested to hear about that or to think about that more, because I think that's a great idea. Okay, um, thank you. And then uh, uh, there's Marcus has a question, I guess. Okay, sure. Yeah, just really quickly, um, you know, I'm just curious if anyone has really has looked at kind of adaptation based off of uh, gradient learning, because you can imagine at least the, the the diminishing adaptation condition might be satisfied for kind of a reasonable class of proposal distributions by kind of annealing a step size for for a gradient update of the parameters. And I'm just curious if anyone has uh, considered that. Yeah, so that's that's a great question too, and of course it's sort of similar in spirit to Tim's, and I think mm -hmm. I might give a similar answer in the sense that I think that's a great idea, and I think it's ripe for that. I'm trying to think if um, yeah, if gradient uh, descent updates, if people have thought about adaptive versions of those, um, nothing is leaping to mind of somebody having done adapting for that. And, but I mean, that's not a bad thing in a way. That's a good thing. It means that it's a great thing to do. And of course, if you do work on it, you should look a little more carefully to see if anybody has done it because I don't know 100 for sure, but. I don't think I've heard too much about, yeah, adapting the uh, stochastic gradient to San, as you say, or other things based on uh, adaption learning from the past. And uh, once again, as I said to Tim, part of it would be, what is a smart way to learn from the past in order to improve it? And probably there are ways, but that would require some thought. And then uh, can we check that they satisfy the conditions? And then of course, can we try them out in practice and see if they actually improve things as much as we mm -hmm. hope? But if the answer is yes to all those things, I think that could be very interesting too. And and as far as I know, nothing's leaping to mind of somebody having done that, in which case it could be an interesting thing. So. 
Uh, and what I will say, just interject really quickly, is that I know the the stand people definitely played with adaptive HMC stuff. Um, they don't do ongoing adaptation. They always cut it off after a point, but um, they they did do adaptation for HMC uh, right. to Tim's point for sure. Yeah, yeah, maybe related to like the um, like the number of steps to do before the accept reject that kind of thing. And they um, were they were kind of trying to adapt the um, mass matrix based on the covariance of the samples. So right. um, adaptation that in that way. Yeah, and of course, sounds like you're saying you know, the finite adaption, which. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we don't, we were in our theory hat. We don't really think of that as true adaptive, but it is. Yeah, it's for sure. about, you know, the uh, first step of learning and then the final step of uh, running regular regular HMC, but with what using what you've learned. So good. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. So we're a bit over time, but I want to ask one question. So, uh, so uh, you you st so you started as a motivation to you know compute this expected value, but I think the uh, theoretical results are for the last uh, iterate of the Markov chain. So, can you give any guarantee for the you know for this problem specifically? Like, wh what can you say about this uh, computing the expected value under a test function of the target? Right. Yeah. So, if um if if, if for our theorems, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. So, I think I I glossed over that a little bit, but um. When we had, for example, our theorem and we said, well, what do you get? I think you're saying if you do have these properties, what do you know? And so uh, we prove a, a convergence of adaption in various cases and including LLN, of course, means uh, laws of large numbers. And by that, we mean that if you take the average of the H functions for the adaptive version, then as the number of iterations go to infinity, it'll converge to the true expected value. So we do have that under some conditions. For example, if the, um, if the function H is actually a bounded function on the state mm -hmm. space, then as long as it converges in in uh, in a total variation distance right here, then it will automatically, uh, the law of large numbers will hold to. Okay. If H is unbounded, it is a little bit more complicated. You can have a case where it converges in distribution, but not in terms of expected values, but at least for bounded functions and somewhat more, we can say it converges in the sense of the expected values too. Was, was that your question or? Yeah, so, yeah. and w what about the uh, inference? Like, can you say any, like, can, do you have any CLT results for this expected value? Or? Um, there are CLT results. Actually, that's an interesting thing too. Actually, there's uh, some uh, some French authors who worked on CLT results. And the, the short answer is you can get CLTs too if the convergence is quick enough. So in other words, um, for CLT somehow, it's, uh, it's not enough just to know that asymptotically you get to the right distribution. You have to get there quick enough so that the averages also are converging to the, the normal distribution. And um, so that requires further conditions. Um, it does hold, but yeah, so the, the French, this work by these French authors, they basically say, well, we assume that the adaptive parameters are converging to the true, to the optimal parameters, to fixed parameters quickly enough that it's a fast enough order that we still get the central limit theorem. So I always found those theorems a little bit artificial because they require not just that adaptively we're getting to the right answer, but we're getting there quickly enough to a fixed, a fixed choice of optimal markup chain. And then because the optimal markup chain had the CLT, so did the, the adaptive chain. Um, so in general, I, um, I'd be a little more hesitant about concluding CLTs just on the basis of this, but on the basis of just the average converting to the right average that, that you can be confident. So. Okay, uh, thank you. Are there any more questions? I have another one if we have time. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, maybe uh, the last question. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, I was wondering if we can see AIS as an adaptive MCNC, or how do you think these two can come together somehow? Um, I didn't quite hear the word. If we can see what as adaptive? Annealed important sample. Oh, and annealed an important. Okay. Um, right. So let's see. Annealed. Um, yeah, so there's different versions of annealing, but often annealing is when you're trying to find the maximum of a function, right? And is that what you're talking about? And you're, uh, so um, uh, different annealing techniques usually are running something like a metropolis algorithm, but then they're also um, sort of raising the density to a power, like- uh, the, Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, so actually I have, uh, it's funny you mentioned it, so I didn't get to show you all the features of my simulation. So let me show you one more. Uh, let me go back to a regular target. Um, so. These green bars I put in because I was doing some work with engineers who were interested in annealing algorithms. And here are the ideas. So I'll run this again. Actually, I'll turn off adapting for a minute just because that confuses matters. And uh, oops, sorry, I'll do the plus or minus two, let's say. Then um, the idea is now it's running still Metropolis algorithm, but instead of doing the accept reject based on the ratio of the blue bars, 
It's doing the accept reject step based on the ratio of the green bars, which are just a power of the blue bars. And then we renormalize this. So for example, whereas this blue bar was a little bit bigger than this blue bar, as time goes on, this green bar becomes much bigger than the, the, this green bar. And it means that over time, the idea is it's supposed to anneal and try to find now not sampling from the blue bars, but finding the, uh, the biggest blue bar, which I guess in this case was the state one. I'm not sure it's going to, I'm a little nervous. I think it, it didn't succeed. Let me try again. Uh, if I zero, we'll start again. Um, but anyway, the hope is that it'll find, uh, maybe it's doing better this time. Um, it'll find the state one and after a while, it'll pretty much stay at the state one because um, the, the powers are increasing the, the differences to the point where uh, the state one has a much bigger green bar because we're taking powers than the blue bar. And after a while, it's always gonna reject and it's gonna stay. So this is an example where we're doing annealing and we're optimizing. So that just brings us up to speed on annealing. And then uh, your question I think was the connections between this and adaption. And that's a good question too, because uh, in principle, while you're annealing, you could also be adapting and the adapting could be helping you to make smarter moves. But of course, if you're doing them both at once, it gets a little harrowing because you're uh, the annealing, you better get the right thing before things get too extreme. Adaption might take a while till it does smart moves too. So I think if I were serious, I haven't done serious sort of adaptive annealing trials, but if you were, I think I would be inclined to do adapting first to get a good markup chain and then start the annealing afterwards to first mm -hmm. the adapting and then the annealing. But it's a good idea. I mean, they're both really good ideas and they both involve changing things as you go. The, 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 the thing that's easier about annealing is you're just trying to find the maximal value. So you don't have to worry then about if you've messed up the markup chain properties or you're cheating on the MCMC, whereas the main thing I focus on is sampling. And that's when, if you're cheating, you're going to just converge to the wrong thing. Whereas just trying to find the maximum, you don't have to worry about the cheating anymore. But anyway, that was a long answer to uh, another short question, but uh, we could, I'm happy to discuss further, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, let's uh, end the talk. So thank you very much for, uh, you know, great talk as always, Jeff, and thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Nice to nice to be at the Vector Institute. Maybe someday we'll really be in the Vector Institute building together. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.